This is Scott Richmond and Arnie Sherman. You're listening to What Do You Know on News Talk KGVO, AM 1290 and 98.3 FM. Arnie Sherman, a good Sunday morning. Scott, it's good to see you again. I've been away for almost a month, so it's good to be back. I was in New York seeing Broadway shows and going to Yankee Stadium and uh, eating my way from east to west, north to south. I walked 200,000 steps while I was there. That's equivalent of 100 miles. I saw 100 miles of New York from the from uh, the street level, and it was uh, it was pretty exciting. But I'm glad to be back in Missoula. Glad to see you, and glad to uh, have Ed Notario on today to talk about his new book, Big Sky, Big Parks. Yeah, I mean he's a very interesting guy, as we all know. He's he goes by the uh, nom de plume as if in the writing area of Bob Wire when he performs as a musician, award-winning musician, voted Missoula Musician of the Year a number of times, and. Uh, but he also is an artist, and uh, he writes, and his latest book is uh, not only about Glacier and Yellowstone, but the big swath of Montana that is in between there, and the, the human stories that he picks up along the way going back and forth. Yeah, what a great, he's a great storyteller, and I've always thought he was you know, synonymous with Missoula, but uh, I think he has an interesting origin story, yeah, too, yeah. on how he got here. He's been here 30 years. Yeah. So, like you, you've been here 27, I've been here 10. Yeah. Nobody? We're, we're connected. We have roots. Some yeah. of our roots are a little bit deep. We're not fifth generation, but, you know, we're, uh, we're well connected. But he has seen a lot of, and he's just focused on telling Montana stories from the mouths of Montanans. Which, you can't beat that. All right. When we come back, our guest is Ed Norterio. The book is Big Sky, Big Parks. Back after this. Arnie, we are back with our guest, Ednor Tirio. Ednor, it's such a pleasure to have you in the studio. We know you by many names, Bob Wire, and your musical career, and you're a, a landmark and a, and a touchstone in Missoula for many artists and for the, for the whole community in that capacity, but you're also an author. And your latest book, Big Sky, Big Parks, an exploration of Yellowstone Glacier National Parks and all the Montana in between. This, the swath in between. The Montana swath. You've written a lot about Montana. What what gives you the inspiration to keep going back to the well of Montana, particularly in, in you know the national parks and and uh, you know what what a lot of Montanans uh, uh, take for granted, but you see the beauty in. That's a good question, Arnie. It's uh, I do tell people that I uh, when I look at anything, it's I I look for the beauty and for the humor. And then I realized I'm not really looking for the beauty. <laughs> <laughs> You're just looking for the funny stuff. That's right. That's, that's how I came about my first book, uh, Montana Curiosities, in 2009. That's all roadside attractions and weird events and oddball people and crazy places throughout the state. And I've always had that kind of uh, curiosity in myself. And this, the book came out of a, a cross-country road trip with my kids. We did the old school three-week road trip across America in about 2008. Drove to uh, North Carolina to visit some family, turned around and came back to Missoula a, a different way. And we always had to stop. Well, we got to stop and see the world's biggest ketchup bottle, or we got to stop and see this other thing. And the kids were so into it, and I was blogging about it the whole way. When I got back, there was a message from a publisher. They said, We have a series of books called Curiosities, Utah Curiosities, and so forth. We're getting ready to do the Montana one, and it looks like you might be the right guy to write this. So I kind of backed into my first book contract. So everything has been an outgrowth of that. Montana is so big and so varied from east to west, north to south. It could be right. eight, ten different states sliced up, all completely different. Well, the other thing you find that you talk about humor. Everyone you run into in Montana has a story of some kind, right? They're, That's and, exactly And right. a lot of them are humorous. Do you collect these stories from around the state from people and then you know, harbor them as your own and then uh, put them in your books. Oh, you've been doing your research. <laughs> I do that. I do. I, I have a program that I give through uh, Humanities Montana. I'm on the Speakers Bureau. It's called Montana Conversations. My program is called Finding Montana. I have a slideshow that goes along with it, and I'll show that and talk about the, the, a little story that comes out of the place I've been, mostly stories between the books, stories that happen during the research, 
And that's when I tell these, we tell these stories that uh, people have shared with me. Oh, like the old rancher back, back in Seiko, back eastern Montana. My very first book, I, I saw that there was a two-headed calf in uh, Stockett near Lewistown. So I drove out there, and the farther east I got, the more two-headed calves I saw, which were when they're born, they're, they only live a few days, but they will s stuff them and mount them. And there's, you go into museums, and there's a plaque with a two-headed two calf head. Like Ripley's, believe it or it not. It is, exactly, yeah. like Ripley's, believe it or not. So the farther east you go, the more common they become. And this was <laughs> bothering me. So this, ranch, this rancher comes out and helps me find a, a Chet Huntley's boyhood school or some such thing. And I say, hey, man, you're, uh, you're a rancher here. Let me, let me ask you this. And this guy's just out of central casting. He's just gaunt and, you know, sunburned and got his hat pulled down low. And I said, what's with all these two-headed calves? It's, by the time I get to Great Falls, I start coming east from there, and I'm seeing more and more two-headed calves. And he looks at me, and he looks off in the distance, and he says, let's just say you don't mess around with old man Mother Nature. <laughs> and then he looks off a thousand yards staring like he's Clint Eastwood. It's like, that's, that's a pretty good story. What does that mean? It's not even an answer. So I have one for you. About I, was, I went by, well, I was in 30 miles away from Chernobyl 12 weeks after it happened. And I'm on a train, and there's a KGB guy on the train named Sasha Kondrakov. And I say to Sasha, Really, what do you guys know about what happened in Chernobyl? And he goes to me, nothing happened in Chernobyl. No problem, <laughs> except for the 12-foot chickens. <laughs> and he starts laughing as well. So everybody's got a story, and don't mess with no Mother Nature, correct? I, I guess that's it. You know, I, I had to come back and do some research to find out what the, what he was talking about. I think it was uh, uh, farmers and ranchers were using DDT. Yes. And before yeah. it got outlawed, it got into the food chain. Yeah. And it's two -headed suddenly cat. two headed cat. This is this is the th great thing about going out there and doing research. I found out early on, all you got to do is go into the Stockman Bar at the end of the day, <laughs> and people say where everywhere, every town has a Stockman Bar. Yeah, that's right. right. So I go in there about five five thirty, sit at the far end of the bar, throw up my notebook. I got a paper road map, and I'm just sitting there. And the regulars start to filter in, and you know ranchers. Farmers, they look at you with a little suspicion. You're an outsider. Hey, you one of them TV people? <laughs> no, man, I'm I'm just uh, here looking for a story. Oh, uh, you a reporter? <laughs> no. Did you go to Lincoln? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all these places. Like it's like until you say, no, I'm here to see the the two headed calf uh, in the Stockette Bar. Is that true that the two headed calf Steve here has a nine legged lamb in his living room? <laughs> you want to come see it? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we're off to the races, and that's, it happens everywhere you go. Like you just said, Artie, everybody has a story to tell. They're just waiting for somebody like me to come along and ask him. Right. Uh, and, uh, and you were able to get enough of them, obviously, to, to, uh, to tell a pretty uh, exciting and, uh, and memorable and interesting story. So for our listeners, by way of background, are you originally from Montana? I know you went to the University of Montana. Tell us a little bit about your history. Well, I did not go to the University of Montana. I uh, actually I was I was kicked out of three different schools before I came here for whatever reasons. You're an overachiever. That's what it was. Right. Ahead of my time. Right. Ahead of your time. Right. So your someone's time. telling a story about you saying you went to the University of Montana. So you did. Let's clear. I that did up. not. Okay. No. Yeah. I'm not really uh, affiliated with the university. Okay. Although I, I married an alumnus. Alumni yeah, you a, did. Uh, alumna E. And your kids. Yeah, both my kids right. graduated from the university. So you're, you're so he's family. connected. He's connected. You're a UM family. Well, my dad grew up in Missoula. Oh, okay. And uh, he was a military guy, so I lived all over the place. And then we'd always come back here to visit his mom, who was still living here since I was born in the early 60s. And uh, so I got to know Missoula my whole life. Right. And as an adult, I was uh, in Seattle. I went there to go to art school in 86. And uh, did my Kerouac phase there for about six, seven years, and met a guy from Missoula, and this guy became my best friend pretty quick. Wow! And uh, his name is Tim Ryan. He introduced me to his Missoula circle of friends. So he, eventually, he moved back to Missoula, and I basically followed him here because I had more friends in Missoula than I had in Seattle at that time. Amazing! 
And so that was in 86, 87? I got here in 93. Oh, 93. I've been yeah. here 30 years as of this summer. Wow. And I tell you, man, I was kind of spiraling in Seattle in different ways. And when I got to Missoula, it was like putting on an old leather jacket that fits you perfectly. Yeah. Things just fell into place mm -hmm. right away. Yeah, your tip. Yeah, I, was there, I ended up buying a house the first weekend I ever spent in Missoula. Is that family. right? That was twenty-seven I, years ago. So smart asset just selected Missoula as the most fun college town in America. I saw that. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me, Ednor. When did you figure out it was the most fun college town? Uh, when I was in college <laughs> <laughs> in Pocatello, Idaho. Yeah, I went to Idaho State. That was that was the craziest seven years of my life. <laughs> yeah, right. That's like my third grade. Best in best seven years of my life. <laughs> well, we used Pocatello like, oh my god. Pocatello, you know the difference between Pocatello and Missoula, in my mind, is that Pocatello, the city, it's it's an old railroad town and a farming town. It basically turned its back on the university. Uh -huh. And they don't welcome the university's energy into the town, into the culture like Missoula does. Right. And that, you, you know, that ha just goes its own way. And Pocatello, a lot of the downtown was boarded up businesses and just was struggling. There wasn't much culture there, but uh, I made the most of my college years there. And then from there, I went to uh, Seattle, Seattle to go to art school. Huh. So it's always been the, the North. But you are, but, but, but it's funny because I've always thought of you as like, you've been here forever. Like just, I've only been here for 10 years, but I was like, he must have been born here. I just assumed that. Well, 30 years is a life sentence these days, right? I mean, he's been here True. most of his adult life. That's, that's How about you, Arnie? Yeah. You've been here for 27, 27 years. I know, 27 years. But, Ed Noor, when did you discover that you like to kind of become this kind of fly on the wall, in a way, like reporting on the stories that are in either your backyard or the backyard that you create, right, with your road trip? Like, how did that develop? Well, I uh, studied journalism in college, okay. so I got the writing style down and the idea of research and fact-finding and all that stuff was already embedded, but I just have the kind of personality where I absolutely cannot take anything very seriously for too long. You know, it's like you take your work seriously, as a musician I take the music seriously, but I can't take myself seriously because, you know, what is this? We're just, I sit around all day and make stuff up. That's my job. People say, like, well, have you thought about retirement? I, I say, like, retirement from, from what? what? From yeah. what? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're a creative guy. You know, you're a writer. You're, you're an artist. You're a musician. You know, you're well-respected in all of those areas. One of the things I liked, I didn't read the whole book yet because Scott just gave it to me a couple of days ago, but I did read the first few chapters. And I liked the focus on the swath between the two national parks because so many people just go to one or the other. And you talk about a hundred different ways to get those seven hours between Glacier and Yellowstone or vice versa. And I thought that was a really interesting kind of uh, way to talk about a big chunk of Montana that a lot of people don't see. And maybe when they read your book, they'll figure out they need to devote more time to the filling between, you know, the Oreo cookies. You know, that's sort of the way I look at it. That's the idea exactly is to, it's aimed, this book is aimed at people who come out to Montana with the idea of taking in both the national parks, and I'm encouraging them to build another day or two into your vacation and take your time getting between the parks. Right. And here's a lot of things you could see, places you can go, things you could do, stuff that uh, I try to get a lot of stuff that even Montanans aren't that familiar with. Well, you also point out an another important factor, which is these parks are so massive and have so many natural assets that you can spend your whole life and not see it all. So you can't really see it in one day, either of them. So why don't, we, why don't you make it into a little bit more of an experience and then visit all these other places which have nuggets of interesting things that, you know, you remember. I had the best steak I ever had in, you know, in, you know, in uh, Belgrade. Or this little Stockman's Bar and, you know, in this other town was fantastic. You know, I, I've known a lot of people who said, you know, on the way to Yellowstone, the Yellowstone was cool and the, you know, the, the uh, geysers were cool. I know half the geysers in the world are in Yellowstone. And, you know, but I stopped off in this little town and there was a guy at the bar who was playing the piano and we had this unbelievable piece of meat and I you know, heard everybody talking about the local culture and, you know, yeah. it made me feel like I would have lived here. 
I mean, that kind, and, and that's what I think, to me, you're, you're incorporating and weaving into your, your tale about the two parks. I think you have to be uh, on about half cheerleader for Montana. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's completely unapologetic, because I just think, why wouldn't you live in the best place in the world for you? And that's why I'm in Missoula. I, when, I, when I first started, three months after I moved here, I met the woman I would eventually marry. Right. And I, I tricked her into marrying me in 95. <laughs> but early on, I said, you know, I can't. I've lived in Seattle. I've lived in Denver. I like being out west. Uh, I like the bigger cities. And I got here, I said, you know, I, I can't live anywhere smaller than Missoula. And she says, you know what? That's interesting because I can't live anywhere larger than Missoula. So it looks like you know, we stuck. can go ahead and buy rather than rent. <laughs> well, we're the, be here. well, the other thing that's happened, is, as we all know, is that technology, the things that you miss the most, which you know, for us is you know, food or, you know, or, or shopping. You've you got to get a jacket for a wedding and you can't find it at Dillard's, right? And then you're, or menswear. You now can get it overnight from anywhere. So right. the few things that you were saying, God, I really need to have that, and the two times a year you really need it, you can get it. It's you don't accessible. Have to leave. Right. Yeah, and that's that, that's all the difference between you know thirty years ago. I lived down in Stevensville and was driving into the university in ninety seven, ninety eight. There was five or ten cars on the road. I mean, there was nothing in the morning at seven a.m. coming back and forth, and you didn't have Amazon, and you didn't have uh, Google, and you didn't have any of those sorts of things. They were just starting. But the life you can have here now, compared to life thirty years ago, just adds icing to you know, being able to stay in a town the size of, uh, of Missoula and, and have all of your needs met. Yeah, it, it's changed dramatically just with technology in the last six, seven years that way where you, know, you, could, you could move here and get a job in Kentucky, right. you know, work remotely, whatever you're doing. So you could still take advantage of, the thing about Missoula is it's so I mean, tight. We, sit, we live on the hillside, and you look down at night, it's like the Hollywood Hills. I right. agree. Oh, yes, yeah. it's beautiful. That's the first thing I said to my wife when we looked um, at uh, South Hills. I was like, this is like Hollywood. Right. Oh, yeah, you're looking down at all the lights. <laughs> it means you can drive 10 minutes and be in the wilderness. Yeah. You yeah. can drive five minutes up Hattie Canyon and be in the wilderness. Sure. So how does your, how do you, you know, you're, you must be an, a, a curious individual, right, just by nature. Right, because you're a journalist and you want to kind of get to the story. So, how do you determine what stories you want to tell? Like, there's, you can't tell all of them, right? So, how did you, with the book especially, prioritize? Right? How did you kind of outline? It? Particularly, particularly because you're a storyteller in your music. Yeah. And so sometimes you have a story that fits a book, I guess, and then sometimes you have a story that fits a song. And how do you figure that all out? Yeah. Outline. Well, I, you know, I rarely use outlines. It's, huh. it's a lot of seat of the pants writing, but I have the, the weird thing, Scott, is that here you guys asked me into this podcast, and so I can talk about myself endlessly, and I really am not built that way. I would rather, that's how most people are built, and I do have that built in curiosity like, well, you know, I don't have to work at it. I need, I want to hear your story. So most people need very little, if any, coaxing to get their story. And I just find it all interesting. Everybody has a fascinating story, everybody throughout this state, and they're just waiting for a guy like me to come along and ask them to tell it. Yeah, it's like local. That's, it's not a, it's not really a local. That's real local, right? You can't yeah. manufacture that. And, and it lasts forever. Yeah, what's so you... beautiful about a book, the medium of the book. Yes. Like it's I was realizing this yesterday. I was waiting for a book to be delivered from Amazon. I'm like, what other form of entertainment do I wait for the mail to come anymore? Right? right. Think about it. Like everything yeah. is at your fingertips. And quite frankly, a book is at your fingertips too. You could get it through Kindle. Well, we did the Netflix D V D thing for a while. Yeah, we, we did. You gotta wait three days for a movie. Well <laughs> well, being a man of the arts, the arts last forever. I mean, we're still listening to Shakespeare from fifteen fifteen, you know, sonnets. We're still watching old movies. We're still listening to music from, you know, 100 years ago. Big skies, big parks will last forever. If somebody wants to read about it, someone's going to, 100 years from now, is going to be doing research. His music. Find the book, his music, the songs, videos. You know, I mean, that, that's the lasting legacy of, of memorializing these experiences. 
You know, I read something very depressing the other day. It said, 100 years from now, there's going to be somebody else living in your house. Oh. You know, your cars, all your possessions are going to be gone. You're lucky if you're the average person, if one distant relative has your picture on the wall, you know, of, of you. You're completely gone. You're erased. You're completely erased. Nobody ever yeah. mentions, you know, Arnie Sherman or Scott Richmond's name at all. Except for these kinds of touchstones. Absolutely. A book, a book like this will last forever. I thought about that the other day. Howard Stern was talking about doing his big house in the Hamptons. Right. And he said something like, when I die, someone's going to move into this house. And I'm like... How are they going to move into this house and not know it's Howard Stern's house? And it was made for him. How do you, you know, think about moving into a home that was made for your profession, lifestyle, interests. And a hundred years from now, nobody will even know who he was. Exactly. Right? Whoever's going to be living. Five, five generations later for people living in that house, if it's still there, if but, they haven't torn it down and built something else, aren't going to know uh, Howard Stern, some guy. Right. But Ed Nord's leaving clues for who he was. These are these this yes. legacy. These are clues to your interests well, and your a, humor. It's a body of work that I think there is a thread that runs through it all, and it is humor. Do you think about that? Do you think about your body of work? Because you just said body of work. Do you think about this this tome of like of stuff? Because you you must. You have well, to. No, I, the I, subconscious. I don't think it. about it in terms of. Having something that people will remember me by, I, I really what drives me is the creation of something of value to every. Okay. To, to right. Everybody it's more the content. It. It's like it's I, content, I found right? something yeah. that's interesting and I think it's important for people to know, and I want to share that. Share it. And if some of me goes along with that because I, I'm writing the words, I'm choosing the words, I'm choosing the humorous approach, yeah. I'm making it the way it is. I'm the chef, so to speak, of it all. And, you know, it's just like an artist doing a painting. You're, you're capturing a scene, but you're also putting yourself into that scene, right? I mean, in some way. Yeah, I am. I, I'm a huge proponent of, of uh, I love gonzo journalism and the, and the whole Hunter Thompson thing. Yeah. And, you know, uh, it's, that's what I go, I, I'm writing for The Independent or Montana Magazine or something like that. I try to, I try to write the story from the inside. Yeah. I pitched, a, I just saw Brad Tyre a couple weeks ago in Helena. Uh -huh. He edited the Independent uh, before they went dark. Right. And I was there running the calendar for a year. Right. I wrote the calendar. Okay. And I pitched him on a, a story. I said, "Hey, listen, this uh, Bar Street Bistro, they're going to put together a dinner of enti of entirely insect-based dishes, and all over the world eat insects. And this is kind of a little bit of a stunt, but it's also meant to bring attention to the fact that here's another protein source." That's right. a lot easier on the ecology for nice. insects. Insects. So I said, "What if I get on there and have, you know eat a bug dinner and uh, write about it?" Kind of a, I'm thinking in terms of well, it's, the, it's a good yeah. Gonzo stunt. Yeah. He comes back and says, "Okay, I want 3,500 words on world, <laughs> food, world food insecurity." I'm like, oh my god! Now I got to do research. <laughs> I got to learn stuff. Didn't Brad marry one of our uh, former? Uh, Yes, on the show, didn't you marry Ian Natwood? He sure did. The uh, jazz musician. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, they're married now. Oh, they are so much Where fun. is she living, though? She's not living here. No, they're in Helena, right? She's I was in Helena. She, oh, she, she came back. She spent a few years in Illinois, I think. Yes, she did. Yeah, raised yeah, her yeah. boy and then uh, yeah. moved back to Helena, and she and Brad, they are tight. They're just a, a magical couple. That's, I love hanging with That's fantastic. Guys. One of the things you mentioned, you talked about Hunter Thompson and Gonzo journalism. I'll never forget reading his story he wrote about the Kentucky Derby where he never mentioned the race itself. How do you I mean and it was and it was captivating and he, he, he captured all the color of what was going on but how do you write about the Kentucky Derby and never mention the horses, the race, or anybody watching <laughs> oh, that's the race? Why, that's why he's my hero. Yeah he yeah. can write about pull that off. No only him. Oh you yeah. know and I always remember the line, right. I don't know if it was in that one or another where he uh, he opened one of his uh, stories with there's a lot of wreckage in the fast lane these days. I've always remembered that one. It's, you know, it's, it, it, it keeps coming back, right? You watch what's going on with, uh, you know, with politics. There's a lot of wreckage in the fast lane. A lot of wreckage. Yeah. How, by the way, as you're writing the book, Big Sky's Big, Big Sky Big Parks, how important is it to give, it, give context of when you're writing it, the time and place of, you know, when this book is being put together? Is that important, or is it like 
it almost ages it if you don't do that. If you just kind of like, you're hovering and you're kind of landing in and zooming in and zooming out. And it could be at any time. Like what's imp Is that important? Well, uh, it depends on what you're writing about. If you're writing about the construction of the Grand Loop Road in Yellowstone, that took decades and decades. So it's that's kind of an evergreen story. Right. Uh, but I actually, I had an extra 30 days before my deadline on this, so I could include a chapter about the Yellowstone floods from last year. Oh, sure. So it really is, that part was up to the minute. At the same time, I, I made some statements in that chapter that this is going to take years to rebuild this road, to reopen this part. Uh -huh. They had it done by that October. Did and, you get, were you able to correct it in the galleries? Well, we put a disclaimer. Ah. I, I thought that was a good way to handle it. It's like, make sure you go online, check out the latest uh, reports on the road conditions in Yellowstone, see if these roads are open or if they have been repaired. They were, uh, there are still roads. They're going to have to change the actual roadbed from the, between Gardner and Mammoth. Oh, okay. that, ro that road was used for 100 years, and somehow they escaped the 1,000-year flood, and it was like from stagecoaches up to tour buses and RVs. That is a gorgeous road through the Gardner Canyon that goes up to Mammoth. But this thousand year flood comes along and shows everybody who's boss. Right. The river is going to find its own path. Mother Nature it's again, it's back to Mother Nature. Old man Mother Nature. How do you, how do you, <laughs> how do you um, talk about all the, the, the growth of growth? Certainly um, is it the west entrance to, to Yellowstone from Bozeman through Bozeman? Like, yeah, to down me, to Big Sky. Right, Big Sky. Like, how do you yeah. like? Do you do you treat, talk about that? Like, this area here has grown to a place where this way in is becoming. I would over, talk about over. that in a magazine article, but not in a book. Right? Not in a book. Okay. Because the book, like you say, is is like this book is gonna you know last for a long time and, and be relevant. For I don't know how long, but Got it's, it. Uh, uh, that, it is something that I do tackle a little bit in the book because of things that have popped up mm -hmm. out of uh, the crowds and the pressure on the national parks that began pretty much uh, during the pandemic. Sure, like they've had the biggest you know attendance they've ever had, right? Three, right. four million each park. It's exacerbated with the uh, sagging economy. People couldn't fly to Europe this year, so we're just gonna you know, drive across the country to Yellowstone or whatever, but uh, for instance, I was writing about in Glacier Park, you can, before they open going to the Sun Road in midsummer, when they finally get the whole road plowed, people are allowed to ride their bikes up as far as they can go. Mm. And they'll go up there and spend the night and then ride back down. It's just a gorgeous, uh, kind of a, a locally known phenomenon mm. that uh, really was kind of a secret among the biking community. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So people would go there and see old friends every year and, and all this. But now, with the advent of e-bikes, people in West Yellowstone <laughs> can rent an e-bike and just put, put their way all the way up to the top of as far as they can go, going to the Sun Road. So this is, this is one of the ways I have to handle this book, is that I'm not really... I have to be very fastidious about putting forth my own opinion. I don't do that. I let people tell me their stories, tell me their opinions, and then I frame it. And then I leave it to the, to, to the reader to make up their own mind. Sure. Right. But I was going to write about, this is one of the things you could do in Glacier. But then I find out it's a massive controversy among the cyclists yeah. and all the newbies. who can, One of my friends who, who really works hard and rides, rides her bike up there in the spring, she says, you know, I'm like puffing away on the west side heading toward the tunnel. And somebody goes by me on an e-bike with a huckleberry shake and a cup holder. <laughs> Yes. And that kind of pissed her off, yes. you know, so okay. Well, because well, the experience is a completely different experience. It doesn't make it a bad experience. You don't have to take a Well, that's the other on side of it, Ari, is that it, it makes it accessible for a lot of people who normally would not have access. Right, particularly older people, maybe, who can't yeah. ride, but they like bicycle, they want to be in the air, and they don't want to drive a car up there because it makes you right. nervous. Or right. they, they want to go up there when there are no cars. Yeah. There's that window, and they want to do right. that. Right, they, they want, want to be. Right. Yeah. Our guest is Edna Tirio. He has written a book. That's not even close. Terrio. Terrio. Bob Wire. Well, I know. It's, it's, give us the correct pronunciation. Well, Ednor rhymes with Frednor. Frednor. <laughs> Terrio, as you say, stereo, but leave off the S. Right. Did you know that, Arnie? Yes, I did. Okay, I want to make sure. I did know that. 
but he is written in the book. So, big, so here's what I find really interesting. Big Sky, Big Parks. Lots of people have talked, uh, written about Yellowstone. Sure. I mean, including uh, you know Ken Burns and Dayton Duncan, who put together a fabulous series on you know PBS on uh, Ken Burns. What a hack! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, structure uh, doing a documentary. Yeah, he doesn't know. But you can write about the same thing from a completely different kind of uh, avenue, and and uh, and cover other things that they couldn't cover, didn't cover because of the of their historic, you know, sort of linear way of trying to describe how the national parks emerged, you know, from Franklin Roosevelt to Teddy Roosevelt and on and all that sort of stuff. And I found it fascinating that you could, you know, you could craft all these stories about the same thing that other people have written about an awful lot and make it fresh and new. And that, that was with that's, a, that's a really good point that uh, a lot of people don't pick up on in that when I pitched this book to the publisher, my right. editor, I said, We're, I, I want to do like a travel guide, but for both the national parks and then a lot of stuff in between. Yep. And she said, you know, there's a lot of, there's a thousand travel guides on the shelf for Montana. Right. Uh, you're a storyteller. Tell some stories. Yeah. Do what you do. Right. And yeah. that completely freed me. She says, if you want to put playlists in here or some yes, parts of yes. that. And so I just, I had absolute freedom, but I'm so rooted in history and journalism is that that is the bedrock of all of it. But then I get to kind of go nuts and, you know, tell things from my perspective and what I think is interesting about this. Yeah, you're the, well, you are a tour guide, but a tour guide of stories and of ideas. Right. And you're not just, like, spitting out facts about, this is what the elevation is, blah, blah, blah. Who cares? Question for you. Arnie brings up a good point. Do you ever think about working in another medium, right? Like film, documentary, things of that nature, because you have, a, you have the... The, the basis of it right there, right? You need a crew, you need a production budget. Yeah. But there's something to be said of you know, being able to vivify and bring this story to a different medium. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever been approached by anyone about that? Well, not specifically. I, I'm still kind of casting around for how can I how can I get exploited, you know, so I can make some money at this. Yeah. That's what I'm saying, right? There's money to be made yeah. if you can get Netflix to give you an advance. Oh man! And then you're off to the races. Or, well, I, I or you get a YouTube to. channel, and you know you have these. Oh, you funny remember that? Yeah, that's right. We thought about that. For yeah, one funny, of our things. you know, funny stories about you know Yellowstone, stories about the West. Or People TikTok. are so fascinated. About well, I think it's like you guys. You guys are already established here with your podcast, and I feel like I've been approached a couple of times. Have like you? these stories would make a great podcast, and I feel like I have that's missed that wave. No, 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 no. I've not missed that one. You've way. never missed, you don't miss the way. Podcasts to me, I mean, there's millions of podcasts. Right. What right. do they say? Like, they say like 500 really make money, right? The others yeah. are just, but if you think about it, it's just oral. It's an oral AU delivery of the information, the content, much like an audio book, right? right? right. Where I don't have the, the discipline to sit and read a book, but I really want to hear the stories. Yeah, the so story, I think it does lend itself quite well yeah. to that. In the podcast world, people follow personalities like right. Joe Rogan or Howard Stern, yeah. or they follow an area like mysteries or you murder, murder or murder, or, you know, uh, one of our other guests. Uh, uh, oh, Tim Ryan. Yeah, Tim Ryan, and then there was another one, uh, Chad. Uh, Chad Dunnett, right. right. Doing the, the, great writer. We Death could have the West. You could have, yeah. you know, it's great. You know, great stories. You know. Unknown stories of the West, and people would listen because they were interested in you know in the stories. Just like you would listen to radio when I was a little kid. You know, you get a, a weekly serial; it'd be different stories. And so, not that we're giving you career advice, but no, it's, but, it's, but it's still wide open. People are still they get tired of listening to some stuff and they want something new. Did you do the audio book for this? No. Huh. That's a start. Yeah, that's a good idea. Do I, the I audio like, book yeah. for this. I would probably read it better than anyone. Of course. Well, or, and you could have voice actors do some of the characters who are telling the stories. Right. Right? That's how they and do these things. And you could throw some of your songs in that are related to Yeah, this. you could, Edward. This is true. You could do Terry on Stereo with an audio book. That's right, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. We don't charge oh, for this advice, you. by the way. This is free warehouse. This is freewheeling advice. This is freewheeling advice. Let me ask you this. This is done. It's in the can. It's out. It's... It's a great book. What's next? What are you thinking about next? Yeah. If you I am talk trying about to, it. I'm trying to figure out what's my next excuse to drive around the state all summer and write it off. Yes. I mean, book I project. Be, right. 
So I, I'm casting around a few ideas. There's, I really, I would love to get something going on a more national level rather than sure. just regional, which is great. I'm going to write about Montana for the rest of my life. Right. But uh, Montana has become a brand so much that, yeah, you know, maybe uh, like a podcast or something would be if I could do the best one right. in Montana. Yeah. That would, by extension, be have a little bit more of a wider aura. Yeah. There's a reach. lot of stories to be told. I remember I mentioned Dayton Duncan earlier who wrote who wrote most of what Ken Burns produced. But he also wrote a book called Miles from Nowhere, which is about the least populous counties in almost every state. A county that only had five people living there and didn't have a store and he wouldn't oh, visit yeah. it all. Did he really? An interesting book, you know, Miles from Nowhere, the least and oh. obviously there were a number of those. He he had a profile of what that had to be, how little per square mile, and he went to these places and you know, figured out how people live when there's not a box store within 300 miles. They don't have Wi-Fi. You know, they're, they're, you know, living on the land. But there are lots of stories to be told. I know some of them have been covered, like ghost stories in Montana. Yeah, right. You know, or, you know, people that were stranded and, you know, you know um, parties that went through here after Lewis and Clark. But there's, there's got to be a whole area up that you, know, you can unearth about interesting Montana stories and connections to, you know, what's happening today. And some of it just keeps repeating thing. itself. Yeah, the cowboy, Cowboys and Indians thing has been mined pretty heavily. Yeah, yes. Uh, early 20th century, the whole, you know, Butte America thing and all that. Yes. And right. Uh, somebody approached me just this week about, hey, you ever thought about doing like a, like hosting a uh, guiding history tour around Butte's historic, it's like, yeah, me and like 8,000 other people, right. I'm not going to do that. I'm right. not interested in that. Well, Nobody has told a story to my satisfaction of a place called St. Marie. Where's that? North of Glasgow, way up in the northeast corner, uh -huh. 30 miles from Canada, you go up the road and there, suddenly there's a town. There's uh, 1,200 homes in a big housing tract right next to where there used to be an Air Force base. Ah, ah that's now, a clue. Now, used to be, yeah. the Air Force base closed down in the mid-70s, the town emptied out overnight. It's like the Andromeda Street. Really? You can drive in there. There's trees growing out of the street. The houses are still there. Doors are swinging on their hinges, you know, <laughs> broken windows. and St. Marie. It's super creepy. All these houses were, like, built in the 60s. The For 70s. the military. For the military. They housed uh, 7,000 military families. And then when the base closed down, there's nothing around there. There's nothing out there but agriculture. Does anybody live there now? That's a good question. I'd say about 150 like people actually, they, they paid the tax lien on the home, 15,000 bucks or whatever. They own the right. home. Right. And oddly enough, there is a condo association maintaining what homes there are. <laughs> in HOA. In HOA. In the, yeah. You're right in. You, yeah. you, can. you, you can't. You can't escape. escape. <laughs> HOA. Right, 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 right. right. Well, here's, here's, you know, there's can't a, have an RV in the parking lot. I mean, that's a, certainly an interesting story. When I came here, and you, I'm sure you experienced I came here in 97, the first people I talked to down in Stevensville were complaining about Californians and other people coming in here driving up prices and messing things up. Same conversation today. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. that conversation, you know, hasn't changed. There's also the conversation about the good old days that I say that never were. Yes. And you say, boy, we really missed the good old days. I said, do you remember what my Missoula looked like in the 80s? Half boarded up and, you know, and it... You know, you could smell the, you know, the paper plant, and you know, right. it was not a pleasant place. Right, nothing good. You old. want it to be like that again? You know, maybe there's this sort of story about what people are saying and what really took place. You know, sort of this juxtaposition. Boy, it was great in the '80s. So you write a little, talk to a bunch of people about living here in the, the 80s, '80s and what it was really like. Yeah, the, the good or the good old days of the, the 2010s. You know, yeah, it's like, really, yeah, good old, yeah. But, well, we had a Kmart. That's really the only thing that was different. Yeah, but I have that. I have my own right. version of that in my head. Right. When I was like uh, uh, four or five years old, my grandmother lived over on North Avenue West, right. and we would hop over her back fence and walk to the which was then a Buttrys. Now it's an Albertsons right. in Trumpers. Mm. We go into the buttries and buy some penny candy and then crawl back through the fence into our backyard. On the other side of Malfunction Junction, which we called it, was a taco shop. Right. 
which then became a check cashing place. <laughs> you keep car. Right. <laughs> and then uh, now I don't know a vitamin store. I don't know what it is now. Right. KFC, Vitality but, vitamin store. Yeah, yeah. It's always something different. But back then it was a taco place. Four tacos for a dollar every Friday. I mean, I remember that from age five. That's when I started eating tacos. But you're right. But Arnie's right, though. It's like <laughs> how good old day. How good were the good old days? And if you could go back in time and really bring that to life and illustrate what it was like, what it was really like. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, in real time, almost like a real time discussion of it based on the historic. You know, you you wax and wane about the good old days, but they really weren't that good. It's everybody has this Norman Rockwell version of it. Right. right. They don't remember the bad part of the good old days. Right. right. If you right. think about it, home movies and camcorders and handheld camcorders oh, yeah. in the 60s, started in the yeah. 60s, 50s, 60s, but in the 70s, 80s, it took off, and you're going to see a lot of documentaries now that mine that footage. Sure. There's so much footage, yeah. which is actually interesting. As a period piece, you could do that yeah. as a book. You so, lead me right to Andy Smetanka's movie oh. about Missoula. His documentary spent seven or, years, seven or eight years making. It's called A Place Sort Of. Uh, <laughs> and he had his premiere two weeks ago. At oh, really? At, he sold out the Wilma. He was out front wearing his, his grandpa's western suit, standing on a red carpet square. Wow. Right. <laughs> that was his red carpet. <laughs> but it was just, that's what he did. He found all this 8 millimeter old footage from right. the early 20th century on. Right. Oh, wow. Just spectacular images of a lot of people's version of the good old days of Missoula. And he crafted it together. To, to go through the four seasons of right. the different eras. Oh, cool. Just a, really a great way to organize it all. Sure. And it was just, it's a huge, wildly entertaining love letter to Missoula. Yeah. But that was the manifestation of that idea of the good old days. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, my friends who grew up here can tell me the uh, like, same thing. Like in right. the 60s and 70s, there were uh, teepee burners on the valley floor. And it's yeah. the smog would stay around, you know, nine months out of the year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was not the nothing you know, good the, there. Yeah, it was not this pristine, beautiful little you know river city. Yeah, we get back to Big Sky Big Parks. Tell us a story about the the swath between uh, an interesting story that you wrote. The Montana swath. Well, the the uh, my favorite part of it is there are literally hundreds of itineraries you can put together to get between the two parks. Do you want to go straight up uh, interstate? You go to I-90, take a right at Butte, up I-15. Yeah. It'll take you up to Highway 2 where you turn left and there's Glacier Park. But I'm trying to encourage people, even if you do that, here's some places you can stop on the way. Mm. Uh, one of the places I loved was uh, older Montana. It's mm. north of Butte, just off I-15. You're heading towards Helena. Boulder was established in the early 20th century during this uh, kind of a road to Wellville era mm -hmm. where all these so-called doctors had miracle cures for Rheumatiz. rheumatism <laughs> and uh, arthritis and uh, cancer and lumbago and whatever you might have if you have enough money. <laughs> so they would build these places like the Boulder Hot Springs, which is there today. Ah, This beautiful Spanish mission architecture, giant facility. Uh, they would all, all these really well-to-do mostly women would come in and they would they would pay all kinds of money So they could come into a room where they sit in a bathtub of shallow water and the doctor puts a couple of electrodes in there and just, bzz, bzz, <laughs> All right. Yeah <laughs> Is your blindness cured? You know or, or whatever and uh, so this is still there and uh, the rest of the week he tortured little puppies <laughs> That's, right. That's an extra $15 I think you've got it did you so they, write about it on your social media, Chico, the Chico Hot Springs? Yeah, we were just there last week. What yeah. was that like? I thought it was great. I, to me, uh, uh, old, classic, and funky is much more interesting <laughs> and shiny and fresh and, you know, clean and new. Disrupt. Right. Lacking of personality. Right, they just fixed up the Hot Springs right up in the near Thomas. Quinn's. Yeah, Quinn's is now all... Oh, Quinn's is like... $300 a night. Yeah, right. It's not, it's, not, yeah, it's, not the, it's not the old kind of hot springs that you're thinking. Yeah, this, this is what they're trying to reestablish Boulder as they're trying to get back to its yeah. former, former glory. I think a group of investors came in and uh, they've already uh -oh. put a million dollars into it. They're trying to maintain kind of the original look and they refinished the lobby. 
And they, the lobby is, it's not like we're updating it. Yeah. We are refinishing it and getting it looking good again mm. in the original style. So I think that's what, what they're trying to do. But at the same time, uh, we're not going to crack, you know, fill cracks in the, the pool with mud. We got to get a little bit more, you know, they at least use newspaper, any old newspapers. So. <laughs> No, they're, they're working Look what on they're it. doing at Big Sky. But it's, I, I did write a book about uh, ghost stories, Haunted Montana. Yeah, yeah. Which right. included a story about a, a girl, lady of the evening. Uh, I forgot her name, but she died there. And the ghost is still there at Boulder Hot Springs, roaming the, all the staff members have seen her. They even gave her her own room. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and I stayed there one night. They were like, <laughs> you, want, you want to stay in her room? I'm like, I'm not even, I'm going to sleep in my car. I don't even want to be here. I think the investors are going to extinguish that idea when they're yeah. trying to maximize square footage. You mentioned hot, hot springs. I went once to Berkeley Springs, a hot springs in uh, Virginia where that uh, oh, yes. Washington went to. And I had a guy give me, I, I for some reason, it was one of the early times I decided I was going to get a massage there. And the guy that gave me a massage was an old African American who was a slave at one time. Oh, wow. He was 87 years old. That was the only job he ever had was working at Berkeley Springs. Wow. And he was like one generation removed from George Washington. And to have that guy actually do his thing was an amazing experience. But it was like the worst high school locker room, you know, that you ever saw where you put your clothes and it was all kind of maintained. There was nothing modern or upscale about it. But to know that you were in the same springs that George Washington went to was an amazing experience. That's kind of worth, that offsets everything else. I yeah, think. right. I mean, you just, I mean, you're, you're, you're there. Our guest is Ed Norterio. The book is Big Sky, Big Parks. Take a quick break. Back after this. Arnie, we are back with Ed Norterio. Ed Nor, so I'm sure our listeners now want to read this book. As I started to do it, I'm going to finish it up as soon as we're done for you. How do they find it? Where do they get it? Well, it's, people ask me that all the time, and I, I do have a few uh, personal copies, but it, it's a book. You get it at any bookstore, Barnes & Noble, uh, Shakespeare Company, Missoula, Fact and Fiction. I really encourage uh, people to go to their local independent bookstores to get this. Um, also, you can get it, it, it's probably not in the parks yet, but the gift shops within wow. the national parks will be selling it, hopefully by next summer. Or Amazon. Amazon is always good. And if they like this book, what else can they read by you? I have other titles. Uh, my, my other previous Yellowstone book is called Myths and Legends of Yellowstone. Then I have one called Haunted Montana, which is a collection of ghost stories from around the state. Uh, there's the Montana Curiosities, my first book, and then the second edition is out on that one. There may be a third edition down the road where I want to do all new curiosities. Beautiful. So we're uh, still working on that. I'm, st I'm still doing uh, speaking engagements through Humanities Montana. Excuse me. Through Humanities Montana, you can book a, a speaking engagement pretty cheap. They, they fund my expenses to go out anywhere in Montana, give you my program, and do that. And what about your music? Well, as Bob Wire, I'm still out there playing, uh, doing a lot of solo shows. Uh, let's see. Uh, October 21st, I will be at the one and only Barbershop Beer Parlor in Hot Springs, Montana. Oh, that's no, that's not true. October 21st, <laughs> I will be at the Symes Hotel nice. in Hot Springs, Montana. Who's booking you? Are you doing your own bookings? Clearly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's either a barbershop or a, you know, a hotel. No, the great thing about Symes, 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 school. Symes Hotel, when you go to the big hot pool there, I've been going there for 20 years. It never fails, and you're gonna you're gonna meet some weirdo in oh, yeah. that big hot pool. And occasionally, I'll look around. It's like, oh my god, I'm the weirdo. <laughs> That's cool. What's your website address? Website is ednor.com. E D N O R dot com. So easy, so yeah. easy. Such a great guest. You're a great guest. Thank you so much for coming up. It was I delightful. appreciate you. Thanks for having me on, Arnie. I will see you next Sunday. Yep. Take care. Thank you for listening to What Do You Know. I can't wait for the next show, Scott. I'm excited too, Arnie. If you'd like to suggest a guest, send me an email at scottrichman at townsquaremedia.com. We'll see you next week. And thanks for listening to News Talk KGVO.